All right, so it is 7.02, gave you two extra minutes, but welcome to the Gut Health webinar. I'm really excited to bring you this information tonight. It's one of my favorite topics uh, because it's you know one of the most important topics. And if you've tuned into our webinars or podcasts or you've heard me speak before, you've heard me say that a lot, that it, you know, lots of things are my favorite topics, but I really am, you know, so passionate about uh, a lot of these health topics that affect every area of your life, okay? And so we've done, this is our, our third webinar now. If you missed the first two, they were on autoimmune disease and thyroid disease. So re two really uh, critical, critical topics, especially in today's 2016 healthcare world, okay? And, and one of the reasons that we started with these three topics is because they are rampant epidemics, but also there's not um, really good, reliable uh, solutions for these. You know, if you have if you have high cholesterol, you know the medical system has a solution. It's take a statin, right? And and we don't need to get into that right now. But there is an answer, and the medical system just quite literally doesn't have an answer for a lot of gut issues. Okay, and they've even run studies where they've compared you know, taking a medication compared to changing your diet and the diet showed a lot better results. But guess what pharmaceutical companies do not care about you changing your diet because guess how much that costs you? Zero. Free 99 to change your diet. So, but this is an incredibly important topic. We're going to get into, you know, a lot of details on it. Um, one of the, the cool things about this is the first time that we did a, a gut health uh, presentation or workshop was two years ago, okay? And, and two years is uh, you know a pretty long time, but a relatively short period of time. But two years ago, I remember starting off the talk by saying, you know, what do you guys think of when you think of the word gut? Because at that time, to, to see a webinar on gut healing, to see the word gut was kind of weird. You know, people think of gut feelings, no guts, no glory, but we didn't hear that word very often. And now I would say that you know, depending on the circles that you that you run in and what you read, the word gut is a lot more common. We know about leaky gut. We know that the gut is connected to our immune system. Maybe we know that it's connected to our brain, or maybe we know that it just affects more than just digestive symptoms. But this really is an incredibly important topic. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to set the stage and show you how incredibly important it is. So we're going to talk about a few things you know we're going to talk about why why do we care you know why is the gut really really important what is it connected to what can it lead to if you have you know a bad gut what causes a bad gut and and what more importantly what takes a good a bad gut to good what fixes a bad gut we're going to talk about leaky gut especially okay and so we're going to lay that out at the end we're going to give you five action steps to take a bad gut to good. But first I want to just set the stage for, you know, why this is important. The other thing I want to mention is, you know, there's a, a we're going to talk about the anatomy of the gut. We're going to talk about, you know, some different symptoms, but we're going to focus mainly on this word called the microbiome. Okay, microbiome. And, you know, you may have never heard that word. We I, I hear it all the time, but it, sometimes I forget that it's not part of normal everyday language. So we're going to point that word out a few times. So I want you to, to keep that word in your head, your microbiome, uh, and I'm going to explain what that is, how we can take care of it, how it you know gets gets thrown off, and, and really what that leads to. So I'm going to pull up uh, you know some of my first slides here, and just show you that. Da, 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 da. Perfect. So this is a popular topic these days, you know, and, and not just, you know, in a healthcare office, but it's reaching the mainstream. So you've probably seen words like this. Okay. So first off, Activia, you know, a, a very uh, big name yogurt brand. And, and one of the things that I just actually found out is Danon, Danone is what it's called in Europe. They're some of the leaders, like the, literally the world leaders in gut health research. So that's actually cool, you know, kind of raised my, uh, perception of Activia a little bit there. But now you see things like healthy life probiotic drinks, maybe a probiotic gummy for your kids. And I just want to tell you with these that, you know, if you're buying your probiotics based off advertising and marketing, you know, kids love gummies, kids love colors, things like that. It's not a good idea. But you start to see that it is a really, really popular 
topic these days. Gut health, probiotics, your gut flora is really popular. Here's another couple of examples. You know, some New York Times best-selling books that have come out recently, one by David Perlmutter, uh, who, which is, this is an amazing book, and it's talking exclusively about the connection between your gut and your brain. Okay, so really, really cool stuff there. Another one is by my friend, Dr. Josh Axe, called Eat Dirt. And if you can see down there at the bottom, why leaky gut may be the root cause of your health problems and five surprising steps to cure it. I actually have not read that book and I, I highly doubt that his five steps are the same as mine, but we're gonna give you five steps tonight uh, in a little bit less time than, than reading that book. But great recommendations there. And here's another one. You may have heard of the GAPS diet. When it comes to autism, if you can see that sign there, it says autism, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, depression, schizophrenia. And so that's one of the coolest things is that they're finding that the gut literally is connected to everything, okay? And so it's a really, really, really important topic, okay? So like that book said, you know, it makes a healthy brain. It fights, you know, uh, neurological problems. It fights uh, mental illnesses like depression, like schizophrenia, like ADD, heavily, heavily linked to autism, the gut connection and what it does to your brain, okay? So really important stuff there. Uh, the other thing that it's really important for is your immune system okay so this is why it's a popular topic and you know I would say that two years ago when we did this uh, you know first gut health workshop this was new information to most people and now you know there's Aaron Andrews commercials on ESPN uh, a different you know commercials for probiotics that are starting to bring some of this information into the mainstream so here's what we're seeing is that your immune system uh, seventy percent of your immune system, seventy to eighty, seventy percent is the number that I, I go with, but resides in and around the digestive tract. Okay, so that's one of the most important things is that your immune system actually surrounds and protects and is part of works intimately with your digestive system. And, and I'm going to talk about this in a second too. But you think about this: your digestive system is one of the only ways things can get in your body, right? Uh, and so when things can get in, the, if we're going to have any kind of defense system, it needs to be right at the door, right? If you go to a club or to a bar, the bouncer is not going to be in the middle of the room, okay? The bouncer is at the door because their job is to not let bad stuff in, people that they don't want in there. So that's your immune system. It surrounds and protects your digestive system in what's called your GALT or your gut-associated lymphoid tissue. So that way when a toxin, when a bad food, when a bad fat, a bad protein gets across your gut into your bloodstream, your immune system can attack it right there, right when it gets in. So that's probably the, you know, the biggest thing because if you lose your immune health, what can that lead to? It can lead to a, a, about everything, okay? And so we talked about in our autoimmune webinar, autoimmune diseases are rapidly, rapidly on the rise today and the autoimmune, a leaky gut is the gateway to autoimmune disease. You can virtually you know, not have autoimmune disease without having a leaky gut. So another thing is the brain health, like those books talk about, uh, but your gut, these, these uh, bacteria in your what's called microbiome, which like I said, we'll explain that in a second, they are responsible for creating things in your brain called neurotransmitters, like uh, serotonin is produced largely in the in the gut by the gut bacteria, and, and a lot of that serotonin isn't necessarily the same serotonin that gets into your brain, like the happiness neurotransmitter, like uh, antidepressants alter uh, alter uh, serotonin, but the other one is called GABA. Okay, and GABA is a really calming neurotransmitter. And you know, if you read those books, they go into quite a bit of detail over most people's heads, honestly of how the gut and the brain are connected. The gut is called the second brain. And you know, people have said for years, I have a gut feeling, or I just went with my gut. And that is not an exaggeration. You literally have feelings that come from your digestive system. Your digestive system is intimately connected through what's called your vagus nerve to your brain. Hormones, really, really important for hormones. So on our thyroid webinar, we mentioned that your thyroid produces a hormone called T4. T4 needs to be converted to T3. And that conversion process, 80% of it takes place in the liver, 
but 20% of it takes place by the bacteria in your gut. And then your kid's microbiome. Okay, so that's a, a, one of my favorite topics, probably my favorite topic is with our children. Okay, and so when you talk about kids, you know, that really is, you know, I mean, quite literally, that's the future, right? So we need our kids to be healthy. And what we're gonna go through in, in a couple minutes here is some studies showing that this is not an adult problem, okay? Digestive problems, bad gut health is not an adult problem. It starts as early as in the womb even, but it starts at birth. And I'm gonna show you some studies that are gonna, gonna you know, show you that and show you what it can cause if you have bad gut health starting right away. But virtually any childhood health condition has a gut component. So when we work with gut health with kids, we see amazing, incredible results because, you know, let's take, for example, a six-year-old and say they've had a leaky gut or they've had dysbiosis. We're going to go into the details of what that means, but say they've had it since they were one. Okay, so they've had it for five years. Then take, uh, you know, maybe my average patient, a 40-year-old woman. Uh, she maybe has had dysbiosis or bad gut for 35 years. Right, so which one do you think is gonna respond quicker and be easier to see you know, really dramatic results? Kids, and it's so, so, so important. Gut health, other than, outside of spine health, you know, gut health is really a, a crucial part of our house and really is what surrounds you know, everything that our kids eat, everything that our kids do is to help nourish and culture this healthy microbiome because I'm going to show you these studies in a minute and, and just prove that it's so critically important for the rest of their life. So when you have bad gut, when you have a bad digestive system, you know, what are some obvious symptoms that people might think of? And, and, and this is the, the cool thing is they're not the most obvious symptoms that you do think of. Uh, so, you know, if you look on the left here, yeah, you could have heartburn, reflux, gas, cramping, bloating, you could be going too often, you could be not going enough. Those are all, you know, symptoms of bad gut health, right? And those are all digestive symptoms. So those are the obvious ones that we would expect. And, you know, these can happen in, in, in infants and newborns. You know, we see a lot of reflux. We see, you know, problems with constipation in, in babies and infants. So these can absolutely happen then, but they're more likely uh, adult problems, I would say, for a lot of these. But then look on the right. These are also symptoms of a leaky gut or of what's called dysbiosis. Okay, so allergies, autism, heavily linked. I mean, this isn't controversial at all. Heavily, heavily, clearly linked. Depression, autoimmune disease, asthma, chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm going to show you an amazing study with that in a minute. Uh, and any inflammatory conditions, which, you know, if you guys... Uh, don't know inflammatory conditions are really everything, okay? And that's pretty much you know every chronic disease, every disease that's you know killing us. They're all inflammatory. All our aches, pains, all the things that you know your grandparents might might have had when you were little. Now your parents have. Now you have. You know people used to get sick in their in their 60s and 70s, and then they got sick in their 50s and 60s. Now they get sick really in their 30s and 40s, and it's starting you know even younger in our kids. But those are the symptoms that you know you might more expect. So, is it is it a digestive problem? Okay, I want to share with you some studies because you know, like those symptoms say, is this really a digestive problem? And yeah, it is a problem with your digestive tract. But I want to go through some of the research to show you, you know, what what some of why, why this is so critically important because you can have absolutely no digestive symptoms. You could go, you know, to the bathroom once a day, pain free. Absolutely no problems, no heartburn, no cramping, no bloating. Same thing with your kids. They could never once complain of a digestive symptom, but their problem still could be coming from their gut. Really common things like skin conditions, eczema, psoriasis, that is 100% a gut issue. So I want to share some studies, uh, and, and I'm not going to take a long time on these because you know, we're not going to get into the, the details of the science. I don't want to bore you guys with that. But one of the things that I want to point out, I'm going to share three studies. Okay. And the oldest of the three came out in February of 2015. 
Okay, so when we did our gut health workshop two years ago, there was a lot of research that had come out on this, but now there's a lot, lot more. And I, I'd say every day, uh, you know, new peer-reviewed journal article comes out linking digestive health to chronic inflammatory diseases. Okay, so this research really is cutting edge. And uh, hopefully I'm going to use these studies to show you just how critically important this is. Then we'll have laid the stage for the importance. Then we'll get into, you know, what are we talking about with the microbiome, with dysbiosis, with leaky gut, and most importantly, how do I fix it? So here's one study published June 23rd, 2016. So I'm going to point out that it was in the journal microbiome. Okay, so you've already heard that word a lot and you maybe still don't know what it is. It is three slides from now or so. So you're, you're getting there. We're getting there to what is the microbiome. But so this was an incredible study where they took um, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so they took patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and they took healthy patients. I'm going to close this while I explain the study and then I'll pull it back up. Da, da, da. So, da, 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 da. so they took uh, patients, healthy patients over here chronic fatigue patients. If you don't know what chronic fatigue is, it's, you know, the name is pretty self-explanatory. You're chronically fatigued and not like, oh my gosh, I'm tired. Like you can't get out of bed. Uh, and I've had several patients, you know, reverse chronic fatigue, but that's how it started. It could not get out of bed. And that's not an exaggeration late in bed, you know, several hours of the day. Or if they did, you know, they go to the grocery store and run an errand, they need a two hour nap afterward from, from doing something simple like going to the grocery store. So horribly debilitating. Um, and so there's healthy patients over here, there's chronic fatigue. They had them all do stool sample and blood draws. And then they handed the samples to a, uh, to, to a team of scientists and they said, can you tell who has chronic fatigue by looking at their gut microbiome? Which, you know, I keep saying that I should tell you that the microbiome is the community that lives inside your gut. Okay, and we're going to get into what that is, but it's bacteria mostly, it's viruses, it, it's, you know, there's undigested food particles in there, there's, you know, it's a whole living community that, that we're going to talk about. But they looked at their lab results and they predicted the chronic fatigue patients 83% of the time. So let me pull this back up so you can read these. These are some quotes from the study. They diagnosed it in 83% of patients through stool samples and blood work, okay? And this is important, this is why I bolded this because we're gonna talk about this with a few of the other studies. Overall, the di diversity of types of bacteria was greatly reduced and there were fewer bacterial species known to be anti-inflammatory compared with healthy people. So they looked at how many bacteria were in there. There weren't as many. Okay, so let's say, you know, arbitrarily, let's say there's supposed to be 100 uh, types of bacteria in your gut. They had fewer, so they didn't have the same diversity. And some of these bacteria are associated with being anti-inflammatory, and those weren't present in the chronic fatigue people. It's very similar to fibromyalgia. It's actually often uh, co-diagnosed co with, with fibromyalgia. So inflammation, they're inflamed, and they can tell that through their gut bacteria. I think that that study is, is amazing. Uh, they didn't know anything about the patients. They didn't get a history. They didn't even ever get to see them. They just looked at their gut. Uh, here's the next one. So is this an adult problem? Okay. This is one. Let's see. Where's the date on here? Oh, it's a little bit older than that last one. That last one was June 23rd, ancient. This one was June 15th of this past summer in the journal Science Translational Medicine. So, And this was uh, from the abstract, so it's kind of a summary of the whole study. Early childhood is a critical stage for the foundation and development of both the microbiome and the host. Okay, and this is the most important part right here. Early life antibiotic exposures, cesarean section birth, and formula feeding could disrupt microbiome establishment and adversely affect health in later life. Okay, and that's huge. That is huge, huge, huge. When you look at all these studies, when you look at all the studies of what, you know, dysbiosis has been linked to, when somebody, when a baby is born not vaginally, first off, they're missing that microbiome. They get a lot of their microbiome even from mom, but as they pass through the vaginal canal, 
they're, they get their first dosage of probiotics. And it's one of the most important most important parts of, of your life, that, the birth process. Uh, and when you're born in C-section, it's more sterile. You don't get those initial sources of probiotics. And it doesn't mean that, that it's the end of the world, but you need to be supplementing with probiotics. And we're going to talk about that later, you know, what exactly you can do. The other one, formula feeding. You know, we have, we have twins. And when we were feeding, uh, it was really, really stressful time. And my wife wasn't able to continue feeding. So we started, you know, on formula and, and infant formulas are first off just complete, complete crap. Okay, so I mean, just literally crap. You know, we bought them from Australia. We made our own. There's a few ways around it, but for the most part, they are crap. And I'm going to go through later when we talk about toxins in food. You're going to see exactly why infant formula can poke holes in a gut. Okay, and, and you know, to a newborn, that is so incredibly important. Then the other one that they mentioned there, and this goes for all ages, but antibiotic usage. Antibiotics destroy your gut. So picture this, if you will, and then I'm going to go on to the third study, but picture this. A baby born by C-section, uh, then, you know, mom's not able to, to breastfeed or maybe chooses not to, feeds them formula. Typical dairy-based crap GMO glyphosate formula. Then let's say maybe the baby is teething, the mom starts giving them children's Tylenol, which if you don't know this, children's Tylenol is a potent depleter of glutathione, your body's master detoxifier. This is not my opinion, this is research out of MIT. Uh, children's Tylenol depletes glutathione. Then say they go in for their, their random, or their random, their standard vaccines, then this child is susceptible. This child is at an increased risk. I'm not saying that the vaccine is going to cause autism, but everybody knows that vaccines are, are linked to autism. Even the people that fight it, like why would there be such a huge controversy if they weren't? They definitely are, but I'm not saying that they cause it. They cause it in the susceptible population. And those are some of the things that can lead to that susceptibility. So let's go through this third study. It is also in children. And so this one came out February 5th of 2015. I put the location on there because in the science world, anything that comes from Cambridge, Massachusetts tends to be important. So this is, uh, you know, out of MIT and Harvard. They did this together and it's one of the largest studies to date. But let's see, I don't need to read the whole thing. The study followed infants who were genetically predisposed to type 1 diabetes. So what that means is that they had a certain gene, okay? And so if you don't know this, let me give a background to this. So your genes, we all have good genes and we all have bad genes, okay? So just that you have a gene isn't, isn't necessarily good or bad, but then the environment is what pulls the trigger of that gene. So genes are like loaded guns. You, you may have heard that before, but the environment pulls the trigger. So if you have a type 1 diabetes gene, you're only at risk if you pull the trigger. Right? It's like if you have a gun, you can have the you know machine gun. It's only dangerous if you pull the trigger. Um, and, and that's the same with type 1 diabetes. It's the same with autism. That's the same with a, a lot of different things. There's genetic predispositions, uh, but the environment really pulls the trigger. So that's important before I go on to this. But they studied these people that had a genetic predisposition, and they looked at the difference, uh, who developed type 1 diabetes and who didn't. They found that the onset for those who developed the disease so those the you know kids that developed type 1 diabetes was preceded by a dry, a drop in microbial diversity okay so if you remember back to two studies ago the diversity of types of bacteria was greatly reduced same thing that they notice here there was a great a preceded by drop in microbial diversity including a disproportional decrease in the number of species known to promote health in the gut. That's really, really similar to what this study was saying with the chronic fatigue. The diversity dropped and there were fewer bacterial species that are known to be anti-inflammatory or beneficial. So this is the exact same problem. And I, and so the team observed a 25% drop in community diversity. And that is, you know, a like really a hard thing to to kind of grasp and wrap your your head around. I was explaining, uh, you know, the other day about somebody that had Hashimoto's thyroid disease and somebody that had type one diabetes. And I said, 
the weird thing is, is that these are the same problem. These, then they are all autoimmune diseases. They're the same problem. It's your immune system attacking something. If your immune system attacks your uh, myelin sheath around your spinal cord, they call it MS. If it attacks the islet cells of your pancreas and, and they don't produce insulin anymore, it's called type 1 diabetes. If it attacks your thyroid, it's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If it attacks your digestive system, it's called Crohn's. It's still all the same thing. And that's really, really hard to wrap your head around. But the beautiful thing about that is one cause, one solution. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get into the digestive anatomy here. But with that study, you know, most people, I remember growing up thinking, you know, the type 1 diabetics, that was the common thing was that, you know, the type 1 diabetic is born a type 1 diabetic, right? They weren't, they didn't become a type 1 diabetic. They had it. It's genetic. But we now know that that is not true in the least bit. It's, a, it's an autoimmune disease. So now I want to go through, uh, da, 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 da. close this. So some of the digestive anatomy okay so we're going to use I, I love metaphors um, so if you have been on the last the last uh, webinars I, I try to give really good metaphors that I, I mean I think they're good <laughs> hopefully they are um, but that you know show you how this actually works um, and, and so the first one is going to be a, an assembly line okay and an assembly line you know I think we all understand the concept of something moves by in in each station there's a different Roll. Okay, I think I have a picture in here of, of an assembly line. Yeah, so there's an old school assembly line, and that's what I want you to picture. You know, not like robots and stuff, but th look at each one of these people putting a different piece on, and then it goes to the next person. So one of the things with the assembly line is that your digestive system is like an assembly line. You know, your food starts at your mouth, starts on your plate, and it ends up in your toilet. Uh, and that's a, an incredibly complex assembly line. And that's, that is honestly where digestion starts, is on your plate. It doesn't start when it comes in your mouth. It starts, and this is amazing, this is the way that God's designed the body to, to heal and function and to work. Uh, you, you smell it, you see it, and, and, and what happens? We all know the feeling. Your mouth starts watering. You start getting hungry. Oh man, that smells so good. I'm ready. That's not that that's your body preparing to break this stuff down. So that's the start of the assembly line. Like, okay, we're about to eat. We're gonna get things moving. So what's the next the next step? The first step? The mouth, right? And, and it's an incredibly important step. You know, if you ever tried to swallow like a piece of steak that you haven't properly chewed up, uh, it's not going to ever get broken down properly. Your digestive system, what it does is it takes food on this end, the whole assembly line is designed to take food on this end, pass it through the assembly line, take the good things out of it. Vitamins, minerals, nutrients, calories, the thing, enzymes, all the things that we want, take those out of the food and keep the bad stuff going out. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, I think, to everybody because we all we all eat, we all make bowel movements, we all urinate. We know that that this is going on, but I don't think we ever stop to think about it. this. Food literally becomes us. We know that we eat food and we grow. We grow fatter, we grow taller, we grow stronger through our food. But how does that happen? It's the digestive system. So it starts with the mouth, and those you know when your mouth starts watering, that's actually your saliva and your enzymes starting to work. And so that's the first step. When you get into the mouth, you're starting to break this food down. You know, and if you've seen your plate and you've seen what comes out at the end, they're not the same, right? So the food gets completely broken down. It starts by chewing and it starts with the enzymes. One of the best examples of this is, you know, you may have done this in grade school. You take a, like a saltine cracker or something, put it in your mouth, put it on your tongue, leave it there for three minutes it will taste like sugar going down. And that's not, it's because it is sugar. It's converted those carbohydrates already into simple sugars through your salivary amylase, which is an enzyme in your saliva. So then, where does it go after the mouth? You swallow it, right? And then it goes down the esophagus, okay? So the food tube, it goes into the stomach, 
Okay, the stomach it does a lot of things that breaks down things as hydrochloric acid, it has a lot of different enzymes, but it continues to really break down the food. It's not a lot of absorption going on in the stomach, more breakdown. Then it passes through the stomach to the small intestine, which is just smaller in diameter, but it's really, really long. Um, in, in small intestine, that's when we start to talk about the microbiome, is really in the intestines, the small and especially the large intestine. But from the small, it passes through, then it goes into the large intestine, also known as the colon, and comes out at the other end. So we, we, we really all probably have a, a fair grasp of how that process happens, even though we probably don't think about it very often. But, it, but look at this at the bottom. This is what is so critically important. Just like this assembly line, you know, say you're building a car, uh, you know, Henry Ford assembly line style, and say you're the guy that installs brakes. Uh, if you miss your step, that's critically, critically important. And each step is critically, critically important. And you, I mean, any step is critically important. You can't have proper digestion without any of the steps. They might tell you, oh, you don't need your appendix. You don't need your gallbladder. Well, what they mean is that you're not going to die tomorrow. But you absolutely need it. And if you've had them removed, then, you know, you can still survive, you know, healthily. But it's not ideal. It's definitely not ideal. I don't think that God made any mistakes when he gave us all our organs. I don't think that any of them are unnecessary. I don't think that any of them are obsolete. They're all incredibly important. But the muscles actually surround your digestive system, and that's what moves that food through there. So you have muscles that surround the digestive system that are like kind of a series of, of rings. Um, and so like if you've ever been in a, a baseball, football, soccer game, and they've done the wave. And the wave goes around the stadium. And it really is a pretty cool thing to see when you see tens of thousands of people all working in unison, making this wave go around. So that's the, the first thing that the muscles do. And, and there's another thing called segmentation. And those are just uh, you know strategies that your body uses to move that food through. It is not gravity. You could be upside down and you you're still digest your food. You digest plenty of food while you're lying down sleeping. It's not gravity that just pulls it through. In fact, a lot of your digestive system isn't even pointing down. It's pointing up and going through like this. So the muscles are what move that through there. Really important part of the assembly line. The other thing are enzymes. Okay, so like I said, the salivary amylase in your mouth starts that breakdown process. You have hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Really, really important. Lots of people are low on hydrochloric acid, uh, HCL, which helps break down proteins. You also have your um, pancreas through there. So your pancreas is one of the accessory organs that secretes enzymes, digestive enzymes, into your digestive system. So these accessory organs, the liver, the gallbladder, the appendix, you know, that's kind of like the, the assembly line. As the belt keeps moving through, as the food keeps moving through, you need to add a door, you need to add a horn, you need to add a set of brakes, you need to add tires, and that is the assembly line. And all of those organs are really, really important. But the most important part of the anatomy is the microbiome. So the microbiome, what does that mean? So and there's two big causes of, of poor gut health, and we're, we're going to talk about number two, the, the microbiome, the most. But I want to touch on number one because it really is, you know, really, really important. Uh, hidden infections, and sometimes they're not so hidden. One's candida. That's a yeast overgrowth. That's really, really common. I'm going to get into some lab results and some things that we've done with, with candida. It's actually pretty straightforward to, to, to treat and to help. But you can have recurrent candida infections, and if you do, that's an issue. That's a toxicity issue. Why does your body have recurrent infections if, if you're fighting them off? Uh, that's something you need to look into if it's recurrent. Um, H. pylori, that's one that causes ulcers, uh, really, really painful. So hidden infections it could also be things like parasites, like roundworm, tapeworm, flukes. This is an incredibly important uh, topic, we, but it's something that we could do you know, a whole nother a whole nother webinar on is these gut infections. It's really next level stuff and it's really like so just so specific that you kind of need to come see somebody, you know, functional medicine doctor, do stool testing, uh, um, 
and, and there's a lot that goes into it. What we're going to talk about more is dysbiosis. Okay, so dysbiosis is an abnormal microbiome. Okay, so microbiome. So what does that mean? So your microbiome, like I said, is is an incredibly complicated um, community. Okay, community of cells. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot, lot, lot that's going on in there. Um, and let me pull this up again. Da, 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 da. So there are, it's not just bacteria. So and you may have heard that there's nine to 10 times the number of cells in your digestive system that than there are cells in your whole body or, or bacteria, but that's not quite true. They've actually quantified that more. That's what they thought, you know, five years ago. There are nine, nine to 10 times the number of, of things in your digestive system, but they're not all bacteria. Your bacteria actually are about 30 to 40 to 50 trillion bacteria. So uh, there's still a couple of them in there, right? And it's roughly four pounds of your body. Your microbiome is this incredibly complex, you know, community of germs, of viruses, of phages, which are things that eat things, of undigested food proteins inside your digestive system. But hopefully this isn't too confusing. If you read below that, this is a living, breathing, eating. These things eat, they produce waste, they, they're organisms on their own. It's a community of them, and they're technically outside of your body, which is really, really weird to think of. You know, the inside of your body is all made of cells, okay? And the things that get in your body are the good stuff, you know, the vitamins, the minerals, the, the nutrients. The things that stay out is the poop. The, the junk, the waste, it's supposed to stay outside of your body. So the digestive tract from mouth to anus is technically outside of your body, which is a really, really, really weird concept. But that's why they say that you're the host, okay? These aren't your cells. These are bacteria. You're the host, and there's the microbiome. And the split here, they say, is about 85% good bacteria to 15% bad bacteria. So it's not like we want all good or we want to get rid of all bad, you need diversity. So, and that's the next metaphor that I want to use is really explain this, you know, how this works or why this is so important. So, you know, a, a big community uh, that's really, really important to the health of our country and to the health of the world is something like New York City. Okay. And, and I'm going to explain this before I get into the other slides, but so New York City, we all know about New York City, and it is really important to the health of America and to the health of the world. And, and you know, use, take 9-11 as an example. Uh, you know, a few thousand people died in 9-11. That shook the world, right? So New York City is one community in America. There's, there's thousands of others, but it's a big one, right? And, and it's really, really important. Uh, so with that, in New York City, you know, what what makes up New York City? Well, there's lots and lots of people. There's immigrants. There's black people. There's white people. There's Native American. There's you know there's ethnicities. If you've ever been to New York City, it's incredible. The culture there is incredible, and everybody plays a different role. Okay, and that's kind of the the point of this is that your community, you know, your city, Salt Lake City, New York City, Chicago, even you know a small town, it works as a community. Everybody has a different role. There are doctors, there are dentists, there are bus drivers, there are teachers, there are cops, there are there are bad guys, right? There are burglars, there are robbers, there are thieves, there are crooks. There are, you know, uh, there's every walk of life. I don't think I need to get into any more of the, the diversity and the complexity that takes place in New York City, but that is exactly what your gut microbiome is like. Okay, so with that, picture that New York City, and picture this, you know, say there's a lot of bad guys, an overgrowth of bad guys. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It's a horrible thing, right? And, and if you know a little bit about the New York City, and I don't, I'm not going to, you know, pretend like I do, but I, I know a little bit about, you know, when Rudolph Giuliani was, was elected mayor, he was really well known for cleaning up the city. You know, there was an overgrowth of bad guys, right? There was a lot of crime. It was dirty, 
and, and you just hear these stories about how kind of trashy New York City used to be. And then in my life when I've gone there, I'm like really impressed. It's really nice. And that's why, you know, people love Rudy Giuliani is because the things that he did there were quite amazing uh, from my understanding of it. But so there was an overgrowth of bad guys. So overgrowth of bad guys is not good. But here's the thing is you don't want an overgrowth of good guys either. You know, New York City, 85, 15 might be about right that, you know, 85% of New York City is good, good guys, good stuff, really good things. 15% is kind of bad, but the 85% overpowers the bad guys and it keeps it functioning, it keeps it moving, it, it, everything works fine. So we don't want all good, we don't want all bad, we want a combination. Okay, and so one of the, the things that, you know, we hear a lot about with gut health is, well, what what makes a you know what makes a good gut go bad? And probably the biggest, quickest thing is antibiotics. Okay, and, and this is just you know not to rip on antibiotics, even though I love ripping on antibiotics. This is more just a, as an illustration. Think about it. anti means against means not. Biotic means life. Okay, so the job of an antibiotic is to kill life. Now, now that's a good thing if you have a bacterial infection, right? You're going to kill the bad guys. But, but what did I just say? 85% of those guys are good guys of the life. There's 100% life in there. 85% of it is good. 15% of it is bad. So when you take an antibiotic, whether that is for your sinus infection, your UTI, your ear infection, which you know they now don't don't recommend antibiotics for ear infections anymore. They actually don't recommend antibiotics for virtually anything anymore except serious infections. Um, that's like dropping an atomic bomb on New York City. Okay, and we all know what that does. We all know what that did in Japan in World War II. It wipes out everything. Okay, and that is not the goal. Okay, so imagine if we wiped out all of New York City. I mean, literally, like a, a, a nuke dropped on New York City tomorrow. How healthy would our country be? How healthy would the world be? You know, the stock exchange. I mean, it would, it, it would destroy everything. That's exactly what happens in your gut. So say there was like, you know, maybe something going on in New York City, something really bad like a, a you know, a, a, a fight, a civilian uproar, riots. Well, you think that the government is going to drop a nuke on it? No, they're going to bring in the National Guard. They're going to fix it properly. Antibiotics are a nuke. Okay, You do not want to use nukes very often. Are they effective? Did it work in World War II? Yes, they're very, very effective. They do what they're supposed to do. They kill things. But now we know that there's, that there's bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. Okay, and antibiotic resistance is a huge, huge problem. And even the like the American Academy of Pediatrics does not no longer recommends taking antibiotics for things like ear infections uh, and, and simple childhood things like that. So that's the, a really, really, really powerful analogy, hopefully, of what your microbiome is like. It is literally that complex. Okay, so New York City, you know, say you want to you want to run for mayor of New York City. It's really, really complex, right? You need to know a lot about what's going on there. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of moving parts, but it, it all works really well and really creates a you know beautiful uh, city there. But it's really, 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 really complex. But that's it, it. Also, you don't need to know all the different parts. They all work together. All you need to know is that it, they work together, and all you need to know is to not drop nukes on it and to have a balance of the good and bad bacteria. When we look back at those studies and they notice that, that that bacterial diversity was lowered, that's not good. You know, like say you had a bunch of people just like me, uh, I would consider myself between the 85 and 15, I would consider myself a good guy. But you don't want all good guys. You don't want all me's. That, that's for sure. You know, that community would not be fun. Um, for, for most of you, it would be fun for me, maybe, but uh, it, it, would, it, would, it would be horrible. Uh, so that's the analogy there, the metaphor there with New York City, and that is your microbiome. It is literally a working community of all these different things um, 
that that create this gut community, this gut environment. So here's a, a really important picture. And so I'm going to show you this. So the gut, well, let me close out and show you one other thing first and explain this. So that microbiome lives inside of your digestive system. Okay, so your digestive system is a tube. And on the outside of that tube is your bloodstream. Okay, so here's your digestive system. You can probably picture food going through there. And there's your bloodstream. So if food gets through that hole, it goes into the bloodstream. So, you know, say you eat a salad, you want the vitamin C, you want the vitamin A, you want the vitamin E, you want those to cross out into, into the bloodstream. And that microbiome is inside here. So when your microbiome, your gut bacteria get thrown off, that's called dysbiosis, it can lead to what's called a leaky gut. And that's what this next image is really illustrating here is that, that concept called the leaky gut. And you've probably heard of this now. There's leaky gut programs, there's a leaky gut, you know, supplements. Uh, there's a lot out there on leaky gut, but we're still just scratching the surface on it because there's no there's no medication. The second that the Bayer or Merck can patent a, a petrochemical pharmaceutical, you're going to hear a ton about it. But you're not going to hear about it until somebody can make a lot of money off of it, unfortunately, even though it is the cutting edge science right now you know i just showed you those studies all from within the last year or so so look at this picture so this i think that you guys can see my mouse laser pointer let me see if i can draw with this oh wow so this is the gut hopefully you guys can see that that's the gut so those are each cells so a crazy crazy thing about the gut your gut is what's called epithelium epithelial cells which are like your, your layers. Your skin is also an epithelial cell. Skin is seven layers of epithelial thick, um, and gut is one single cell layer. So you imagine you know, I take something like a, a key here, I scratch myself, you know how sensitive your skin is, you know, and if you go a little bit deeper, you can draw blood. That's through seven layers of epithelium. Your gut is one single layer. It's incredibly, incredibly delicate, that one layer. And that one layer's job is to let the good stuff in and keep the bad stuff out. Another metaphor that we use is a screened-in porch, a screen in general. A screen is one single, really, really thin layer, but it's really effective at letting good stuff in, cool breeze, fresh air, and keeping bad stuff out mosquitoes, debris, you know, anything that you don't want coming in, bugs. Uh, that's what a screen does. That's a lot like your gut. So looking at this picture, that is the screen. Okay, that right there is the screen. These are things that can affect that screen, affect your gut lining. Food issues, okay, we're going to get into that quite a bit. Antibiotics, we just got into that. Stress can affect it. We're going to get into that too. Blood sugar problems can actually cause dysbiosis, which leads to a leaky gut. Parasites are another one. Other prescription drugs. Prescription drugs de destroy the gut lining. All of them. NSAIDs, which is like your, you know, your uh, even over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatories. Toxins destroy the gut. That could be things like tap water, or that could be things like you know heavy metals uh, in your fillings or, or something else. Uh, pregnancy can affect the gut and organ defects. So a lot of things can affect the gut, but if you see all those arrows are just attacking this gut lining. And so these cells are really, really close together. In fact, the, the, the space between that cell is called a tight junction. Okay. So you want that junction to be tight. Okay. Uh, this is a hole in the tight junction when these cells become inflamed. When these cells become inflamed, it pokes holes in this lining and bad things can get in. So you see down here, food intolerances is a big one. Autoimmune disease is another big one. They can breach the blood brain barrier, which means that some of these things can get in. Like, like let me give you an example of something that I can tell you that, that can breach the blood brain barrier. Um, actually, let me keep this up. Um, aluminum. Aluminum is really, really 
uh, ubiquitous in our in our food supply now. It's not also it's you know people talking about mercury with vaccines. Aluminum is really the issue with vaccines. It causes massive massive brain inflammation. But aluminum doesn't readily pass the blood brain barrier in in adults and kids are. That's why it's a concern to to shoot kids with aluminum. They don't have a blood brain barrier. There is no barrier. There is no wall. The aluminum can go right into their brain, and, and that's just basic anatomy. Um, but in an adult, glyphosate, which is Roundup, can actually help aluminum get into the bloodstream and get across the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. So that's a uh, you know, really, really big concern. I, I can't get into it anymore without wasting a lot of your time. Um, inflammation or inflammatory diseases or nutrient absorption issues. So that is really what, what the downstream effects are from this leaky gut. And you can see this. I don't know if you can see this because it's kind of a crappy image. This is normal. Okay. And, and those cells, um, those cells are like this. Okay. So literally like this. There's two cells touching and they're tight, okay? And there's a junction between there, but we want it to be tight. So the next picture I'm gonna show you, they, they just put gluten in the body, okay? So, and this is not in a celiac person. This is just gluten into your gut. So, you know, I had somebody say to me recently, well, isn't it true that people that do a gluten-free diet that aren't sensitive, they could actually be harming themselves? Absolutely not, a a absolutely not. And there's tons, hundreds of studies proving that gluten it destroys the gut. Um, so it's something that I encourage everybody to avoid. If you tuned into the last webinar, thyroid disease, we talked about how the thyroid molecule closely mimics the gluten molecule. So after your immune system begins attacking gluten, it then starts attacking the thyroid. It's a really, really big deal. But so look at this picture. They, they just showed, gave your body gluten and took another slide and this is the cells. It is down here, gliadin is, is the protein in gluten. So these are tight junctions, these are loose junctions. That is leaky gut. Now over here on the right, this is after taking a, a certain product called Restore, and it brought those guts, the, the cells back together. But when you can see this image, you can really see that, you know, it literally immediately in the presence of gluten, uh, in the presence of, you know, for certain people, in the presence of dairy, uh, in the presence of soy, they literally can show that within a few minutes, uh, they have a leaky gut, and they can prove that. You can you can look at it on a slide, and, and what they what what they say is that you know if you're gluten insensitive, your your celiac, one single instance, starts an inflammatory cascade that can take up to six months to to subside. So huge huge issue. Another one that they did the exact same studies with is is glyphosate. Glyphosate is Roundup. It is in your food, even your organic food. It is. Quite literally, in my opinion, the the largest threat to our health right now, uh, glyphosate in the food. All this research is coming out of, of MIT um, on glyphosate and GMOs and vaccines and how they destroy the gut and destroy the brain. And now, when you get on Facebook and you have you know some mom saying, "Oh, you need to vaccinate your kids," she doesn't know these studies. Okay, she hasn't read this science that's come out of MIT within the last couple of years, and it's not mainstream mainstream you know public knowledge but the science is really 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 clear and cut and dry on this stuff so let's get into some some uh, meat and potatoes of, of this talk and you know what what we can do about this so here's a, a first thing is how do you know so so how do you know if you have gut issues um, there's a couple tests that, that, that we run uh, there's a couple more too but you know, comprehensive stool testing that's really important for uh, uh, hidden infections um, really, really important. It's kind of weird to, to you know gather your own stool sample at, at home. You know, just just being honest because I've, I've done it, um, but it's really effective. The other one is dysbiosis testing. And so I'm going to run through a couple of these and show you a few examples. But you know, the the, the reality is, do you need testing? Probably not. And, and you know, on the thyroid webinar, you know, that's that's not what I said. You know, I, I said you do need it um, because with the thyroid, we can really see. You know. Step one, step two, step three, they're easily measured in the blood. Um, it's not controversial. The gut is really hard to measure. Everybody's gut is a little bit different when you talk about their, your, your New York City 
is different than somebody else's New York City. Okay, um, yours might be New York City. Somebody else's might be London. Somebody else's might be Paris. Somebody else's might be you know Dubai or something. Um, and then the bad gut health is like you know somebody else's might be like uh, Syria or a place that's really war torn or you know really destroyed. But the testing. So let me show you a couple examples here of just some of our patients and and why you might you know want testing to to find out if you had a serious issue. You know, you're coming to me as a you know functional medicine doctor and not not you know just looking to support your body's natural uh, processes. You really need to correct something. Yeah, you're going to probably need testing. But let's go through a couple examples. I don't know how clear these are, but this is a three-year-old girl with horrible eczema. Okay, so eczema and psoriasis, acne are all gut issues. That sounds weird if you've never heard that before, but they are 100% gut issues. Okay. And so if you see on this little girl, she's three years old and you see here, it says compounds of bacterial or yeast origin. Okay. So it's measuring these different compounds that are, you know, you can't pronounce any of these. You don't know what they are. You don't need to, but it's measuring them. And when they're off, it's a sign of dysbiosis. So you see this H here in an H here. So she's high on both of those. This little girl has dysbiosis. She was three at the time when she came in for this. Uh, and, and, you know, what happened was she had really, really bad eczema. Like, I mean, really bad. The worst that I've ever seen, really. Um, and, you know, we did some testing. We gave them some suggestions and some protocols. And this was a couple years ago. This was like two or three years ago. And this summer, her mom emailed me and said, hey, her eczema has never come back until now. So for two years, it hadn't come back at all. It hadn't been a problem. It hadn't bothered her. But she was reaching out to me this summer saying, hey, we need to get back in you know, to your office uh, because it's actually you know, starting to, to get bad again. So through this test, you know, it kind of helped us you know, see what was going on with her. Here's another one, a six-year-old autistic boy with no speech. So autism you know, is 100% related to the gut. Um, and that's, you know, that that's most autistic parents know that they're working with things like probiotics, but they're, they're, you know, making, they could be making some mistakes. And so one of the things I'll point out here is the top of his, you know, if you read that, it says toxicants and detox, detox indicator. So you see he's high on the first detox indicator. And then on the last detox indicator, he's really, really close. The red is maybe is abnormal. He's really, really close in the middle one. He's pretty close there too. But then down into his gut, he's high on the top marker. And then you see this other little red H down here, very, very high. Dysbiotic gut in this six-year-old autistic boy uh, who had really, you know, great, you know, some, some good results in, in our office. Here's a woman that, uh, one of our testimonials on our testimonial board. She, uh, she got off thyroid medication in our office, got off bone density medication. That's another thing that, you know, the gut is crucial for. It's, it it's absorbs all your minerals that are great for bone health. So you can see here that she had a high detox indicator. But if you look at her gut here, none of these are abnormal. There's two that are really, really high, really, really close. A couple that are really, really low. So maybe just some imbalance. But down here, d arabitinol it's called, that is a sign, and you see it says yeast and fungal. That's a sign of what's called a, a yeast overgrowth or a candida overgrowth. Okay, so you can, you can measure this. And candida, you know, there's essential oils that we can use to fight candida, but it really, it feeds on sugar. Okay, it, it really straight up, it just feeds on sugar. So you do a no sugar diet, that's also, that's also a candida cleanse diet. Now, what if you don't eat a lot of sugar already and you have candida, well, that means that something else is underlying. Um, but usually something pretty, you know, really, really easy to, to treat. And like I said, this woman, by, by working mostly with her gut, um, her testimonials in, in the room, uh, it says, I was never diagnosed with IBS, but I had all the symptoms. So she really, you know, her most debilitating symptoms were digestive symptoms. Um, but at the same time, you know, she was on a thyroid medication. She was on a bone density medication. So we, st we, we worked with her spine, uh, but we also worked with her gut. And she, you know, not only didn't have the symptoms anymore, but got off her thyroid medication and her bone density medication 
as a result of the gut healing protocols, which is really, really cool. Uh, the last one is just to show you that, you know, sometimes you have a lot going on. So you see a high here in detox. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven abnormal markers out of, you know, what's on there, 12 or so. So there's a lot, lot going on there. So I do not think that everybody needs to get gut health testing, but I wanted to go through some examples uh, of some experiences that people have had and how we've been able to find what's going on. But each one of these, we weren't treating, you know, one, one marker. Um, we weren't treating, you know, oh, you're high in indican and you're low in d -arabitinol. We're not trying to balance those. We're looking at your overall body. And, and lab testing can just really give us a, a good picture of, of some things sometimes. But really with gut health, you know, I, I think that for 90% of people or 80% of people, you don't need it. What you need are these five action steps that I'm about to give you. So first off, how does a good gut go bad? So what causes this? You know, we already looked at that back here on uh, this, you know, food issues, stress, antibiotics. But so how does a good gut go bad? Like, how did I get here? Well, stress is a big one. And, and I, I throw that in there all the time because it's so critically important. And it's physical, it's chemical, and it's mental or emotional. And you might ask, you know, if, if, like, how can, you know, physical stress, like being in a being in a car accident or playing football or uh, uh, sitting at a desk job with your head forward all day. How can that cause a bad gut? Well, physical, mental, and, and chemical stresses all create the same stress response. Stress is stress is stress to your body. And your number one stress hormone, cortisol, which is elevated when you're stressed, causes gut inflammation. So that's a huge critical component. This weekend I was at a seminar, kind of a you know functional uh, functional medicine type type seminar. So there was there were MDs, there were chiropractors, there were naturopaths, there were acupuncturists, there were PhDs. There's all kinds of people, and they all spoke. And we're talking about you know protocols and things that we use and things that we do, and everyone's different. You know, I mean. The, the acupuncturist isn't using chiropractic in their protocols. They're using acupuncture, and they get great results, and so do we. So we're all comparing, and it's all level playing field there. But the one thing that kept coming up is everybody said, man, we got to address people's stress. Okay, I heard somebody say today, we're all on the freeway of life with our car in second gear and the gas pedal to the floor, and our transmission is screaming. Okay, so that's everybody today with their stress, and it does absolutely affect your gut health. That's all I'll say about it, and we'll get into it again in the, uh, the action steps. And then toxins. Okay, so toxins poke holes in the gut. So food toxins, and then actual chemical toxins like uh, fluoride in your tap water, or uh, glyphosate, which is Roundup, like I said, or food additives. We're going to go through those. Let me get off this pointer. Um, so... Five action steps to make a bad gut go good. Now we're getting into the meat and potatoes, uh, into the real you know bulk of this talk. What can you do? And like I said, for for 90, 80 to ninety percent of people, these five steps are, are going to do it. And I'd say you know ninety percent of people because within these five steps, there are small tweaks that we can make. You know, make it individualized for each person. There's no cookie cutter protocol that you're going to do, even the Real Health Leaky Gut Protocol, is not a cookie cutter thing. It's different for each person, but here they are. One, eat only real food. Number two, address your stress. Number three, take the right supplements. Number four, use ancient healing methods. And number five, do a, do a leaky gut protocol. Uh, so eat only real food. Uh, this is so, so incredibly important. And it sounds like a, almost a duh thing, but you know, if you took, I don't know, a hundred people and, and, and pulled, when was the last time they all ate a, a fake food, it would be within the last couple hours. Okay. And that's every single person. You have to be really, really specific if you're going to eat real food. Uh, so you need to only eat real food. And that's a simple, simple step. Um, we're going to talk 
uh, it, about some some other things with that, but some food additives um, and some some things. Da, 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 da. Uh, but food additives are one of the uh, one of the biggest problems. I think I have that right back here. So yeah, food additives, GMO, and glyphosate. So eat only real food. So I, I want to go through uh, something real quick here. This is an article that I wrote, you know, a, a while ago. But it's called, uh, and this was the the title of the journal article: Seven Food Additives That Cause Leaky Gut and Autoimmune Disease. Okay. And so when you point these out, these are in everything, and you are eating them and you are feeding them to your kids, okay? And we just went through the studies showing what that can lead to. So, you know, when your kid develops type one diabetes or Hashimoto's disease, that you don't know it, you didn't do it on purpose, of course, God no. But that was something that can be controlled, okay? And so our kid's diet is fairly well controlled. And some people might think that we're strict parents or something, but I read these studies. Uh, so seven food additives. And so this is from a journal article from published in the journal Autoimmunity Reviews, and they're going through these food additives showing that they cause leaky gut and cause autoimmune disease. So well, number one, sugar. Sugar feeds candida, and you know according to this study, it causes leaky gut. Um, number two is salt. So this is huge, okay? This is a quote from, from the study. The salt content in processed foods. Now here, this is the full quote. Cereals and baked goods. You know, you think, where do you get salt from? You don't think cereals and baked goods, at least I wouldn't. Cereals and baked goods are the single largest contributor to sodium intake in the U.S. and the U.K. The salt content in processed foods can be 100 times higher than homemade meals. So that's, that's, that's added salt, the sodium content. The reason that, that iodized salt is so bad for you is because real salt has up to 70 minerals in it. Iodized table salt has sodium and chloride. You're not getting a balance of minerals. You're throwing off the balance with magnesium, with all these other minerals. Sea salt is completely different. So, you know, maybe you came from your cardiologist and you have high blood pressure and they said avoid salt. They're talking about this, okay? They're talking about processed foods. You're like, oh, I'm going to not eat salty foods. I'm going to eat cereal and baked goods. And there's a hundred times more sodium in there than there is in your homemade meals. That's insane. So sea salt is completely different. I'm not telling you if you're on a blood pressure medication to eat all the sea salt in the world, but it's completely, completely different. Uh, number three, emulsifiers and surfactants. Okay, so I'm going to read this as a quote. Widely used in the bakery, confectionery, dairy, fat and oil, sauces, butter and margarine, ice cream, cream liqueurs, meat, coffee, gum, beverages, chocolate, and convenient food industry. All the junk, <laughs> uh, but the standard American diet. Uh, numerous synthetic surfactant food additives have been shown to increase intestinal permeability through a couple big words here. Uh, so this is like soy lecithin is, is a, a, a bad um, emulsifier and surfactant, um, or polysorbates. You can see that on your label. One of the scary things, there's also a, an emulsifier, polysorbate 80 is a main, not a main, but an ingredient in many vaccines. So you're injecting that. Um, number four, organic solvents. The organic solvent chemicals, this is a quote from the, from the study, the organic solvent chemicals are genuinely dangerous. Most of them have warning information on the labels as poisons. Examples of organic solvents used in industry are benzene, xylene, toluene, turpentine, uh, turpentine, acetone, hexane, uh, ethanol, and several detergents. Some nutrients like glutamine and polyphenols protect against uh, leaky gut. So glutamine, we're going to go through that as one of the supplements. So it says some nutrients can actually protect against leaky gut. In contrast, Several organic solvents used in the food and be beverage industry, like alcohol and its metabolites, impair the TJ barriers, which is the TJ is tight junctions, right? Tight junctions. So these things open up that tight junction. So that's number four of the seven food additives. Uh, number five is gluten. Um, don't need to go into that one. Number six is called microbial transglutaminase. Um, that is meat texturizers or meat glues. Sometimes, and this is gross, but sometimes, you know, the steak that you get uh, or the meat that you get 
All that meat didn't come from the same part of the body, which is disgusting. They took the meat and they glue it together with, with compounds that are generally regarded as safe by the FDA, while you know the journal Autoimmunity Reviews is publishing you know, all the clinical research or all the, the scientific research showing that it causes leaky gut. Um, so yeah, that's a, uh, so this is the, I'm reading once again a quote, multiple applications exist, improvement of meat texture, appearance, hardness, and preservability. So you touch your meat and you feel like, oh, that's nice and soft. That might be chemically induced. Disgusting. Increased fish product hardness, improved quality and texture of milk and dairy products, uh, my gosh, improved texture and elasticity, you know, et cetera, or improved texture and volume in the bakery industry. If you notice, five of these so far out of six are in all the baked goods. Actually, all of them, because the one I didn't talk about much was gluten. So we talk about eliminating carbs and grains and things. They're full of these food additives. It's not just wheat, pure wheat that people have been eating for thousands of years. It is all these additives that are in these carby crap foods. And number seven, nanoparticles. Um, that's a new and fast growing technology. We don't know a lot about it yet. It's not going to be on your food label, but it absolutely causes causes leaky gut. So the bottom line there is to eat real food. When you eat real food, guess what it doesn't have? Additives. You know, I eat from my garden as much as I can. And when I don't, I want to eat organic and I want to eat non-GMO as much as possible because GMOs destroy your gut. And, and, you know, glyphosate, which is, uh, you know, non-organic food, a lot of it, um, it it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum antibiotic. That's what I was looking for. So we already talked about what antibiotics do to the gut. You're eating a ton of glyphosate in the standard American diet. It's destroying the gut lining. Most of that research is coming out of MIT, and it's amazing. The research is like stacks on stacks on stacks. Oh, new thing just came out. This was recent, like two weeks ago. They tested, this is from MIT, MIT tested all the vaccines uh, that the American kids get, uh, the whole, the whole, you know, rounds or protocol through six years old or whatever it is. I think there was two that didn't have glyphosate, that weren't tainted with glyphosate. MIT, they said they submitted, you know, papers to the regulatory agencies demanding that, you know, this is criminal. Uh, they haven't gotten a response yet. Shocker. But every single vaccine was contaminated with glyphosate. So if you're not scared of putting it in your mouth, uh, you, or you're not scared of injecting it into your, your baby's arteries. Um, so eat real food. <laughs> My favorite topic. So obviously I get a little carried away on that. But uh, address your stress is number two. So you have to actively address this. And there's a lot of things that you can do prayer, meditation is one of the biggest ones. You know, I just got a new meditation app that somebody had suggested at, at my seminar this weekend. It's called Om Vana. And, and meditation, you know, is a really, really popular thing these days, but also really, really powerful because it's, it's just turning your brain off. But you have to address your stress. We have some resources for that. You know, we've got a stress workshop on our podcast. We've got several podcast episodes about stress. So I'm not going to really get into that, but exercise, you know, physical, chemical, emotional stress, you know, uh, moving, laughing, having good, loving relationships, um, prayer, having a spirituality or, you know, connectedness to a cause greater than yourself is, you know, a huge thing that literally just decreases stress. But you have to do that to make a, a, a bad gut turn good. Number three is take the right supplements. And, you know, we could spend the rest of the time on this, but I don't want to. <laughs> Probiotics are probably the biggest one. You know, most people know about that. So I want to go through some of these. So probiotics, that is literally bacteria that are going to repopulate your gut. So you take the probiotic and it uh, repopulates your gut. But, uh, and, and we're going to talk about in a second some of the suggestions of how to take probiotics. But I also have a new article that's coming up on the blog. It's the do's and don'ts of taking probiotics. It's the, the top tips for taking probiotics because there's a lot of mistakes that are happening today. You know, we hear about probiotics, we hear that they're good, so we go out and buy one, we kind of like it, and we take it forever. Well, that is what we talked about, that you're overgrowing 
good guys. You don't want overgrown good guys. You don't want overgrown bad guys. It's also, say you're taking one that has, you know, one or two strains, maybe like what's called an acidophilus is a really famous, you know, strain that, that you'd see at a store. You don't want an overgrowth of only acidophilus. If you remember back to the studies, the original studies at the beginning of the talk, what they showed was a decrease in diversity. Okay, so you want to take a diverse probiotic. The next supplement that is really, really helpful for gut health are digestive enzymes. So I actually didn't bring the one that I'm, that I'm currently taking right now, but I have a couple others that we have as, as samples here in the office. The one that I'm currently taking is by Systemic Formulas. It's called D-Digest, and it's available on our store on our website, um, and it's, it's, it's inexpensive, um, but it's, it's great. I, I, digestive enzymes are a really important part of my uh, – protocols just just daily but here's one see if we can see that multi-digestive enzymes here's another one from garden of life omega um, but yeah great great stuff there's a lot of different brands I've tried a lot of them I haven't really found you know that big a difference but they can be taken uh, two different ways one you can take them with a meal and they help you break down your meal that's what I do uh, occasionally I'll take them on an empty stomach but it's not really a, a, a goal or a an urgent thing of mine, um, but to help break down my foods and to just make sure that I'm absorbing everything that I that I need to be. Um, and the other thing you can do is take them on an empty stomach, and they'll actually go through and get into your bloodstream, and the enzymes break down food particles. So if there's undigested gluten, there's undigested dairy, there's undigested food particles floating through your bloodstream, the digestive enzymes can actually break those down. So that's a really uh, powerful supplement to take. Another one is glutamine. Uh, like we, I mentioned that in the study, but glutamine has been shown to uh, you know, restore the, the tight junction uh, integrity there. Um, or another version of it is here called L-gut. And that's really what, what we're starting to, to use more in the office. Um, we've used glutamine a lot in the past with, with you know, great, great results. This isn't a glutamine replacement, it has glutamine in it. So this is L-Gut by Systemic Formulas, an amazing supplement company. Uh, so it says Leaky Gut Mastery. And I'll just read you know, some of the things that are in here. And, and these are other good supplements on their own. But you know, you hear about this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and, and you gotta just pick one or the other. Well, what Systemic does is they, they combine everything uh, that works synergistically um, to, to help heal and seal the gut, but also heal the cells. It's an incredible company that I've been just massively, massively impressed with. And so if you see on our store, on our website, or in the office, we're transitioning to only carry pretty much their supplements because they're the best I've ever seen. They're the best that I've found. Um, and they're, they're physician grade, meaning you can only get them from a, a doctor or a licensed healthcare practitioner. Um, so I, I think that brings a higher quality, higher level of quality and a higher level of accountability because, you know, as opposed to Garden of Life, you know, this is what we used to carry. Garden of Life is everywhere. It's a huge, huge company. Everybody knows about it. So if you take this and you don't get the results that you want, what are you going to like? Go call Whole Foods and, and, and call Jordan Rubin and, and tell them? No. But if a patient, a client is taking a supplement and they're not getting well, they're not going to continue being a patient or a client of mine, right? So these supplements work okay and so when they're physician grade supplements you need them to work because you want your patients to continue being patients so a couple things in here glutamine apple cider vinegar uh, grape seed extract um, goji mangosteen uh, do RNA DNA duodenal tissue factors this is huge that means that it takes the supplements to the the, the intestines to make sure that all these products are actually getting where they need to go. So really, really cool uh, product here. Um, so let's see, what were those others? Um, I think that I, no, there it is. Thought I lost my, thought I lost my uh, PowerPoint, but there it is. Um, okay, so Glutamine, Elga, another one's called Restore. That's not one that, that we sell, but that, that slide that we showed before, uh, we're about to sell it. But the slide that we showed before, when you take Restore, it literally closes those tight junctions. 
And then the last one there that is called bind. Okay, and so bind, we got it right here. Bind is also a detoxer. That's why it's called bind. It binds toxins and it binds bad things. It goes through your digestive system. It's activated charcoal. And people have heard about activated charcoal. A lot of people take it. You know, I, I consulted with somebody this week that was taking it. Um, but most of it, honestly, is not not the best um, because it's a it's a binder. Okay, so it's a binder, meaning it sticks to everything. So if it's not handled with the utmost care and precision, your supplement that you're buying off the store, off the shelf at Sprouts or Whole Foods, is has toxins. It is attracted to those and has bound them. So I'm not a big fan of taking just any activated charcoal, um, but I'm a huge fan of bind. Okay, really, really crucial, uh, especially in a lot of our detox protocols. But as you know, you know the gut is really phase three of detox. So they're, they're not separate. Uh, they work together. So that's a really, really crucial supplement there. But taking the right supplements is important. But probiotic is probably the biggest one. So what should you look for in a probiotic? And once again, like I mentioned, I've written an article on this. But you want a high CFU. Okay, that's colony forming units. That's basically the strength. How strong is this thing? Over 50 billion is what you want to look for. You know, like a Garden of Life is 85 billion. Some are, you know, systemics. Systemic, you know, I, I know the, the biochemist is systemic, so I know that they tested it consistently over 200 billion, and even after a year on the shelf, but so they felt comfortable putting on the label 100 billion. Okay, so it's really, really strong, but the label is even, you know, misleading um, in, a, in a safe direction. They didn't want to overpromise 100 billion. Multi strain, you want more than 10 strains. The probiotic that I recommend that I'm going to show you in a second is 29 strains. You do not want to keep taking the same one. That is so critically important. You want to cycle your probiotics. Even when it's multi-strain, even when it's high CFUs, I do not take a probiotic all the time. It's not something you don't really want to take anything all the time. Even vitamin D, even fish oil or omega, even a multivitamin, you do not want to take that all the time. You want to cycle supplements. We have a new a new podcast out about variation, about varying your exercise, varying your diet, varying your supplements. And this is probably the most important one because you can create a monoculture. Remember that image of, of an overgrowth of good guys can be just as bad as an overgrowth of bad guys. And then the last thing is soil-based organisms. Okay. And that's really, really important that those are different strains. Most of the, the, uh, the probiotics that you know you've seen at the store, you bought off the shelf, they're lactic acid based um, and not soil based. I Meaning they come from a, they mostly come from cow, and that's your fermented foods and things too. But soil based organisms actually go through the digestive system and break down undigested proteins, waste particles, uh, and so it's really really important. And, and you know my my colleague Dr. Josh Axe, he's just got his new soil-based probiotic out on the market. And he's the, the industry leader in leaky gut. Um, but it's still at the same time, you know, it's not just go buy any product. What he has mimicked that off of and copied that off of is this Prescriptacyst, okay? And Prescriptacyst is the is literally, the, you know, the industry leader. Um, oh, I got another slide on it. Um, in probiotics, it's the best probiotic I've ever seen. It's the best probiotic I've ever used. I don't really recommend uh, any other probiotics other than prescriptacyst and, and you know I found it you know validating to find that like in a book like the autoimmune solution um, you know that's the only thing that they recommend is prescriptacyst a lot of functional medicine you know people in my my field only recommend that one brand and, and this is that monoculture um, and but this is prescriptacyst okay so you can get that on our store okay I'm going to try to to wrap up with the last couple of action steps here, but we have a supplement special. Buy a Prescriptacyst this week. This is actually in the office, in the clinic. Buy a Prescriptacyst this week and get a free jar of bone of epic bone broth. Okay, so I've got that right here. I can show it to you when I pull the camera back up. But if you buy a Prescriptacyst, if you buy a probiotic in our office, we're going to give you a jar of bone broth to try it out. Okay, and there's a few other specials that are going on on our on our website right now, um, and they're on the gut 
the gut packages, the gut protocols, and I don't have time to really go into those. But if you've got a serious condition, if you tuned into this because you know you have a leaky gut, you battle with eczema, you battle with psoriasis, you battle with autoimmune disease, allergies, asthma, any of these things that we've been talking about, fibro, chronic fatigue, some of my, some of my big passions, um, you might need more than a probiotic, okay? And hopefully that's not, you know, hopefully you know that. But, you know, it's not just like, hey, take this supplement and everything's going to be fine. Supplements help support your body's, you know, healing and detox. But for most people, what we see for most people is they're spinning their wheels with supplements. They're taking a probiotic. They're taking a vitamin D maybe. They're taking without without vitamin K2 in it and, and like, that's horrible. Um, they're taking a, a fish oil, which, you know, also not really good to take fish oil all the time. Um, a lot of research coming out about that because research five years ago was like, oh my gosh, fish oil is so anti-inflammatory. Now it's like, oh my gosh, maybe it's not when you take it all the time. Um, but people are spinning their wheels with supplements. They're buying things that they see online. They're, they're just making their own packages or they're taking one thing at a time. When supplements can be really, really, really beneficial is when you package them together and you, you do a protocol. Um, and so for maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe three to six months, you're taking a lot of supplements. And then, and then you work on mostly maintaining that, some to support, but mostly maintaining through your diet. Once you get back to a, a healthy you know, baseline, you shouldn't need to take a ton of supplements all the time. It's not even you know, for as many supplements as we sell and, and we push and encourage because they, they're incredible. They really are incredible. You can heal this through your diet and through some of the ancient healing strategies we're going to say next, but it's going to take a lot longer. And some of these really nifty supplements speed the process up dramatically. So on our store, I digressed, on our store, there are two gut health collections. Um, one's for general gut health. One is for pathogens, a pathogen purge. Clean out, you know, if you've got a, a hidden infection, you've got a candida overgrowth, you've got H. pylori, you've got a fluke, a tapeworm, something like that. Those are on special on our website, on the store. So the next action step, though, is very, very important uh, to segue, and also to segue with that jar of epic bone broth, it is to use ancient healing methods. Okay, so we call these ancient healing methods because they've been around forever. So fasting, okay, so fasting is actually healing for the gut. Drinking bone stock or bone broth, really, really, really beneficial for your gut. And the last one is fermented foods. And fermented foods are incredible uh, for healing a leaky gut. But if you have a leaky gut and you're just like, I'm gonna go out and buy some sauerkraut, it could make things worse. Um, so you don't just want to jump on to, to fermented foods necessarily right away. In fact, there's a lot of articles that show that using something like uh, prescript assist for, for, for a time period right before you add in fermented foods can be really, really beneficial. But why they're beneficial is, you know, we talked about probiotics and the CFUs being in the billions. You know, 100 billion is a, is a strong probiotic supplement. Well, they've studied fermented foods, and in a single bite, you're in the trillions. Okay, so fermented foods are a huge source of probiotics. Okay, so sauerkraut, kimchi, um, you know, you can, you can make your own fermented foods. You can ferment about everything. Actually, I put it down in my lunchbox, but I have a jar of fermented salsa, you know? So if you follow us on Instagram, uh, we posted a picture that I made a bunch of fermented salsa from our garden, kept the dirt on the plants. You know, we want those soil based organisms didn't wash, didn't wash the plants, threw them in a food process and then put what's called starter cultures in there. Let, let it sit out for a couple days to ferment. And now I have fermented salsa. It's fantastic. So those, though, can be used, those ancient healing strategies. And actually, while I have this camera up, I'll just show you if we can see it. Epic bone broth. So we have, this is 100% grass-fed beef bones. Um, we also have articles on our website, how to make your own bone broth. That's what I do more often. But, you know, people are, are a little bit intimidated. Um, by making it, it's really easy. Um, but the, you know, it's easier to try this. You know, and it's affordable, and see if you like it. So the last thing, the last action step, and we'll wrap up here is putting this all together really uh, into a, a, a protocol. Okay, so say you think you have a leaky gut, 
and say you want to implement all these things and you're kind of your head is kind of spinning you're like man oh man dr taylor where do where do i start um and so that's a, a good time to do a protocol and there's a lot of protocols out there dr axis is great dr jockers is great they're they're, they're all very, very similar. They're all teaching the same principles, but this is you know how I teach mine based on you know what we've seen and, and what I encourage. So it starts off but with a bone broth fasting. Okay, and that's that's tough. Okay. Um, so let me pull the slide back up because I give a few pointers there. So the phase one is actually fasting to give your body a little bit of a break. And this is the end to um, the last action step here. So you're reducing inflammation. So think about this. When you're fasting, how much work does your digestive system have to do? Well, none, right? You're not eating. And, and that's the same with a juice fast. That's the same with a water fast. That's the same with a bone broth fast. But bone broth has a lot of healing properties to it from the bones that actually help heal and give vitamins and nutrients to your gut lining to help heal it. So you're reducing inflammation with a bone broth fast, okay, four to seven days. Now that can be intense. It depends on, you know, how well your blood sugar is regulated, lots of things. You know, some people to go a day fasting would be almost impossible, but after they regulate their blood sugar and do some things, it, it can get easier. So I've got a couple pointers on the next slide with phase one, but it starts with a bone broth fast. So we reduce the inflammation, we start to heal the gut. Then into phase two, we start to add food back in because, you, you, I mean, you need it, right? Um, so you start adding food back in, but the goal is to not inflame, not create any inflammation. So we're not adding back in gluten. We're never adding that back in. There's always out. But we're not adding back in, you know, pizza or ice cream or anything that we just talked about, you know, with the uh, seven food additives. This is more like some soups, stews. Um, some really good things like this. And what we're going to do, you guys, I'm not going to get into this much more, but we're going to send out a follow-up email that's going to have the details of this, and it's going to have a lot of recipes. So a lot of really, really good things you can do. Smoothies, you know, smoothies are a great thing that you can start taking to get some nutrition going, some real food nutrition, without your digestive system having to do a lot of work. Okay, and then after you've kind of reassimilated the foods into your digestive system, started taking a probiotic, started building that gut flora back up, then on phase three, you're going to trans transition back into a real food diet. So phase one, four to seven days bone broth fasting. I'll tell you, that's intimidating. You know, we had patients uh, this weekend that, that, you know, were bone broth fasting, and they did two days, which is awesome. But it, they, I said, how was it? They said it was rough. Um, and, and so, you know, to each their own, I, I, some people have said that it's easy. Um, we have, you know, some people that, that start off with the goal to go three days and there's something about that fourth day that's, that's, that's magic. So we, we try to encourage people to go four days because a lot of times at day four, people feel so good they keep going. And so they keep going to seven, they keep going to eight. You know, we had another uh, patient who did one the weekend before um, and, and she had already done an eight day one in the past. So she knew that she felt great. She knew that she lost 10 pounds in eight days. Um, so over the weekend, she did a bone broth fast, lost another five pounds, was really, really happy about that. So you can do any, any amount of time, but four to seven days is what we tell people to shoot for. You know, we just had a patient, uh, complete a 28 day water fast. So you can, you, you can, you're, you will survive. I, I'm not encouraging you to do that, but if I put you on a deserted island, you are not going to die if you have water, right? So you you will survive with fasting, even though it sounds like you might not. Um, but you know, being a little ketogenic and things like that can can help, or not being used to you know having high high blood sugar or bad blood sugar regulation. So it's pretty self-explanatory. You're fasting, but you sip on this. You don't expect like one of these jars to be your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You just sip on it throughout the day when you really feel like you need something. But a couple recommendations that I'd say, just based on some experiences that our patients have had, make sure you like it. That's why we're carrying it in the office. I don't think that this is as good of quality as what I can make in my crock pot, but make sure that you like it. And then ease your way in by doing a couple one day fasts. You know, for maybe a week, maybe fast on a Tuesday, fast on a, a Friday. You know, every other day fasting is really beneficial. 
it's not for your gut health though. You want to do the block fasting and try to go four days uh, of fasting. Um, but yeah, you, there are ways to ease your way into it. And what you know, what my patient said the other day, they said, you know, I think that we'll we'll give it some time and then we'll try it again, which is exactly what you want to do. And, and they'll tell you they don't want to try it again this weekend. Um, it's not that type of thing. So phase two, this is also called like a mini gaps. Uh, the GAPS diet, you know, it will, will recommend that you do this for, for multiple years sometimes, but you're starting to do easy diet to digest anti-inflammatory foods. Once again, we'll have some recipes for those soups, stews, smoothies, steamed veggies. So if you still like bone broth after your fast, which I hope you do, my wife did, did four days. She's done it twice within the last couple months. She did a four-day water fast and a four-day bone broth fast, and, she, and she, she, she really liked it. The first one was a lot tougher. The second one was so much easier. But the goal of this phase, phase two, is to start eating again without stressing your gut. Okay, so you know, use those resources that will give you the recipes. But this could go on forever. You know, this doesn't need to be 10 days or 14 days. There is no set time. You slowly start adding foods back in, making sure you're not getting any reaction, and then you keep adding and adding and adding. This is really kind of a bridge between phase one and phase three. Phase one is fasting, and phase three is your normal diet. So phase two is really the, the, the bulk of, of this protocol here. This is where you begin to add gut healing supplements. There's, gut, there's essential oils, there's glutamine, there's L-gut, there's digestive enzymes. So there's, this is where we would start adding those supplements to give your body a chance to break down the food easily. Okay, and then phase three, we're, we're focusing on repopulating. So your probiotic lifestyle, your fermented foods, your real food diet. You know, real food diet that's high in fiber and things can maintain a good, healthy microbiome. As long as you don't do any of those food additives and things, you can maintain a good, healthy microbiome without, you know, taking a bunch of supplements for the rest of your life. So that's phase three. So once again... The five action steps to make a good gut go bad, eat only real food. That's an action step for every talk that I've ever given, every talk that I ever will give. It's an action step for life. Uh, eat only real food. Address your stress. Same with that. You know, that affects everything else, and it's, you know, it's, it's our society today. Um, so, you know, if you're, yeah, you can be part of it or you can, you know, choose to, to not be. Uh, take the right supplements. Use those ancient healing methods and do the leaky gut protocol. So if you can combine all those things together, depending on where you're at on the gut health spectrum, you know, you might need to do all those supplements. You might need to do this for longer than a month, or you might just need to take a probiotic and, and your, you know, symptoms that you're experiencing will go away. And we always start with the most conservative approach, but we've seen so many great results with, with, gut health with eczema going away, with psoriasis going away, with skin clearing up, with digestive symptoms going away, with autoimmune disease reversing. You know, on the autoimmune webinar, I shared a, a testimonial from a patient who shared her labs, and she said there was no medication as part of this. And, and it, it was labs over like nine months, and we showed how they gradually improved. She said there was no medication involved in this process, only real food and a lot of probiotics. Um, so yeah, when you piece this together, there really is a solution. But the first and most important step is stop pouring gas on the fire, eat real food, address your stress, decrease the inflammation so that you can you know, live and be the healthiest, strongest version of yourself and, and hopefully live a life of what we call real health. Okay, so the last thing I just want to say again is if you go to www.wealignutah.com, backslash store our store is now live okay so you can now buy our supplements through our website and there are some big specials on those gut healing collections so if you're interested at all in those get on the website and check those out otherwise if you're a patient and you need probiotics come in you're gonna get your free jar of bone broth we have right now we have beef and chicken uh, we got turkey on the way, and we have a bison apple cider on the way that's a holiday special. So I'm pretty excited about that. So thank you guys for tuning in to the Real Health webinar on gut health. And make sure you tune in next month. We're going to be talking about blood 
sugar okay and blood sugar it's gonna be eight days after Halloween it's actually not the first Tuesday because the first Tuesday is the first it's going to be the following Tuesday so it's mean to do blood sugar the day after Halloween so we're gonna do it the next week so make sure you tune in then maximum blessings as always stay healthy and tune in next time